from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power.
Life has changed as we know it. Terms like social distancing, stay at home, and lockdown. We're experiencing confusion, fears, uncertainty. But there's one thing that never changes. It remains certain. Jesus Christ. Why not turn to him today? sounds of new life. What a great job they did. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, God is good. I say God is good all the time. Hey, we want to offer our condolences to Anita. She lost her brother this week. He passed on and our prayers are with them and with the family as they go through these next troubling days at the loss of and, and uh, grieving over the loss of their own uh, loved one. Also, we want to give God some credit today and thanksgiving today. Uh, Pastor John and Marguerite's daughter and uh, daughter-in-law and uh, her father were in a car accident. Uh, the, little, the little grandbaby has to have surgery. She has a broken femur. But thank God it could have been disastrous and God protected them. And Aisha has already been released from the hospital. So praise God for that. Amen. Amen. Also, this Wednesday night, don't forget Connect. It starts at 7 o'clock uh, on uh, Facebook Live. And my special guest this week is the head of our intercessory prayer and our prayer, or not the intercessory prayer, the prayer chain, uh, Mrs. Linda Crow. She'll be with us on Wednesday night. Tell her we're excited about that. 
And then the following Wednesday night, we will be back here live in service today, uh, that day. Uh, we will be live here and we will have a worship time right before the elections. And remember to pray for these elections. It is important that God gets represented, re represented in the government. Somebody say amen. You know, and we have believers in the government and we believe that God will raise up even more and we will see this nation be the nation under God that it's called to be. Amen? Amen. Let's get our Bibles open to Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis, the first chapter. We're, we're in a brand new series, only a couple of weeks into it. The series is entitled Colors. And it's talking about a message for the current times that we're in. You all know about the riots. You all know about the racism. You all know about all that stuff. And so what we're studying this series is how we, the church, respond to it and how we get victory for our nation. Somebody say amen, please. And it starts all the way back here in the Garden of Eden. And so that's where we pick up right now from Genesis, the first chapter. And I'm going to read there at the 26th verse. And God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over all creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that we can trust in your word. And then when we do, Lord, you open the windows of heaven for us and you allow the spiritual laws to overpower the natural carnal laws. So I thank you, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, that we hear what the spirit is saying today. I give you glory and honor for that in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. With just a little bit of review, we've already studied this part of it, and we've discovered that God has created us in his own image. And that explains why I am such good looking. That deserves another amen. We're created in his own image. We have in us the power, the ability, the creativity to be able to represent him here on the face of this earth. In fact, what's really interesting when we begin to study this, that God created us in his, in, in his own image, so that places us, that places us next to God in power and in position. Now, we know that Jesus sits at the right hand of, his, of God the Father. The Holy Spirit is here on the earth. But when he created us in his own image, he created us with powers and authority that even the angels of heaven do not have. They have a limited amount of power. The difference between you and I, they know how to use what they have and we're not sure of how to use what God's given us. Please say amen to that. So what happened is we've got this situation now where his abilities and the things that God is able to do, his ability now becomes our ability when we use it through the laws of righteousness. When I am in right standing with God and he has given me the authority, the ability to use his laws, the laws of righteousness, the laws of right standing with God, I now have the ability to speak his word over situations of my life that bring me in alignment with what God has for me. I can speak and say, by his stripes I'm healed. I can speak and say, you know, I need, I need to pay my bills and I believe and speak a spiritual law that my God supplies all his needs, all my needs according to his riches in glory. Now, I'm going to explain something to you because I've had people talk to me about this in the past and they said, well, pastor, 
Jesus said that if we had the faith of the size of a grain of mustard seed, we could speak to that mountain and be and say, be thou removed, and it would be cast in the sea. How many have ever read that passage of scripture? Somebody say amen, please. So why can't we do that? Have you ever tried? I don't know about you, but I've tried. I just wanted to see what kind of faith I had. And I found out I couldn't even shake the mountain, let alone move the mountain. And all of a sudden, I began to realize that there's got to be something different in what Jesus said when he said, if you have faith the, the size of the grain of mustard seed, you know how, how small a, a seed of mustard seed is? It's so tiny. And he said, if you just had that, you could say to the mountain, be thou removed and cast in the sea, and it would do it. So why can't we do it? Because when we're casting a mountain into the sea, we're not able to do it because we're not doing it through the power that's in us. What do you mean by that? We think that the power that's in us can accomplish anything we want it to do. The problem with that mentality is we bypass God's laws of righteousness and move over into a self-centered law. When the disciples said to Jesus, they had met a group of people they didn't receive them well. The disciples came to Jesus and said, in fact, the sons of thunder came and said, should we call fire down on them? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. So what's the difference between the spirit that he was talking about and the spirit that they wanted to activate? The power of your authority is the foundation of love. You know why you can't cast a mountain into the sea? Because it's not based on the foundation of love and accomplishes nothing to benefit mankind. You can't just walk over to the mountain and say, be thou cast into the sea and be thou removed because the purpose of it has nothing to do with serving the purposes and the intents of God. And truthfully, at that point, it is not about your faith and your level of faith. It's the power of your faith. And the power of your faith has to operate in the same exact form that God operates his power in, and that's the power of love. And God's word says God is love. So when he created all this around us, he didn't create it for his benefit. He created it for our benefit. And he did it when he spoke to the mountain, when he spoke to the sea, when he spoke to the sky and put the stars in the sky and the moon and the sun. He did it from the power base of his love for the creature, you and I, that he was about to create. And so everything that's around us that was created was created through the authority and the power of love. And so there they are in the garden. They've been created now. And they've been created through the authority of the laws of righteousness, the laws of right standing with God that he has passed on to us. And he has taken that and created this environment where man no longer had to do anything except enjoy the fruits of the land. He didn't have to labor. He didn't have to do anything. And as you and I already know, he was created in the spirit. Now we got this man created and all his, all his heirs, all his children, God created his wife, Eve, they're in the garden, and now the enemy comes along and he is about ready to try to get them convinced that the, if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they will be like God. Now, we learned last week that the only thing that they were picking up was evil. They already had the good. So the enemy had to talk to them and convince them that that's not really what God said. 
If you eat of that tree, you will know things that God knows. Now watch this, because this is so significant to us. The devil is now on earth being cast out of heaven. And because he's been cast out of heaven, his authority as the worshiper of heaven has now been removed from him. He is now rendered powerless on the earth. He is now in a position where he can't do any of the things that he did in heaven until the man transfers his authority and his power over to the enemy. And so what happens here is he comes along and he begins to speak to Eve and he begins to try to convince them to transfer the power that God has given them over to him. Because right now at this point, he has none. Now, I want to stop for a minute. I want you to get something interesting here. The moment you and I read a story like this, and that comes from Genesis, the third chapter, it says there in the first verse that the devil was more cunning, more, you know, uh, evil than all the other uh, uh, creations on earth, the serpent. So we have Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, created after the image of God, and we have the enemy. The Bible calls him the serpent. But at that point, they're all spiritual. None of them yet have taken on the form that you and I walk around on the face of this earth in. They were created after his own image, after God's own image. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Say amen, please. And so what happens is now in this place, it is a spirit that must look like the form of a serpent and two individuals, Adam and Eve, who are spiritual beings, and they are now communicating. Now listen to me carefully. When God created Adam and Eve in his own image and he made him a spirit man, that spirit man could talk to every other spirit that was on the face of the earth. He talked to the serpent who was hiding or in the form of or whatever of a serpent. And it says there that the, or the Bible says that that serpent was able to communicate to Adam and Eve a thought, did God really say that? In other words, to put doubt into their mind. Now, here's something that's really important to you and to me. When he was in heaven, he was the chief worshiper. He had all the authority of worship. Listen to me carefully. He had everything up there. He honored God. He, he worshiped God. He praised God. He was the leader of the band. Uh-oh, Steve. Steve Safe, he got his name in a parking spot just recently, so he, he's not going anywhere and not being cast out. So watch this. He's the chief worshiper in heaven. When he upserts his authority, God kicks him out of heaven, sends him down to earth. He is now rendered powerless. He's now got to tr trick Adam and Eve in surrendering their par power and transferring it over to us. Because, listen carefully, because it's going to give you a breakthrough this morning. Because he was the chief worshiper and he got kicked out of heaven and lost that power as as Adam and Eve 
had to transfer their power and authority over to him, God took his power of worship and transferred it over to us. You know, if you're not born again, you can't worship God. You don't have the authority. You don't have the laws of righteousness working on your behalf. You cannot worship God. You can say, how, oh, thank God, or whatever. You can use his name in vain. How many people use his name in vain? But you can't worship God until you're born again in the spirit because worship is spirit and truth. Please say amen. And I don't know about you, but have you ever noticed when you're going through a tough time, when you don't feel good, when you're frustrated, when you're aggravated, it feels like impossible to worship God. Hello? You'd rather complain. You'd rather look at the situation. You'd rather, uh, you know, what is this? When is this going to end? Da, 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 da. In times of trouble, it's almost impossible to worship God. Why is that? Why does the enemy keep you from worshiping God? Because that's where his authority and power was, and it's now been transferred to you, and every time you worship God in the worst situations of your life, you have have power over those situations. You have power over the attack. You have power over the enemy and worship brings you the break. Restores the creative authority that God has transferred to you when you became born again. And that's why you have the authority that if you're battling a sickness or disease to speak spirit truth, by his stripes I am healed and I worship you and thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. So that's why the devil hates you to worship because you take the authority that God has given you over you. So when your obedience you begin to receive the good of God. When you are in the toughest situation of your life, if you do nothing more than just say, Jesus, 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 you don't have to say anything else. And God looks at that and says he's worshiping. She's worshiping. And the spiritual laws begin to overpower the natural laws that affect you here on the face of this earth. Can you say amen to that? Come on, say it out loud, please. Amen. I mean, say it like you really mean it. Amen. Praise God. You got to worship God that way. The other day I was in the, uh, in the oral surgeon and he had pulled a tooth the other day and now I had to have another tooth pulled. And, you know, and I was in the chair and he's trying to get this tooth pulled and it ain't coming. Anybody ever been there? I mean, he's, oh, we have, <laughs> uh, the, the root was swelling around the thing. He thought it might have calcified into the bone and he's yanking and jamming and everything else. And he said, man, I cannot get this. And this oral surgeon, he does this all the time, correct? Right? And he can't get this tooth out, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, I should have told him I'm rooted and grounded in the word of God. But I was sitting there, and I mean, you should have seen this thing. I got my mouth open. He's yanking. His assistant is there holding my jaw up because he's pressing down and yanking and twisting. And I sat there and saying, he ain't going to get this. And I just, under my breath, began to worship God. I mean, just worship God. Just, thank you, Jesus. You got this. I praise you. And I'm sitting there holding on to the chair for dear life. You know, because his pulling is lifting me right up out of the chair. And I started worshiping him. And all of a sudden, the oral surgeon says, pop. Oh, there it is. He didn't know I was using the strength of spiritual authority Amen. over the strength of a tooth's root. Amen. The devil don't want you to worship God 
And the best thing that you can do when you're in a struggle for your life, you need to worship God. And the word of God says this, listen, obedience is receiving the good of God and disobedience releases all the evil and the laws of this world. So what happens is, and here's something so cool that God gave me, obedience becomes a weapon of my warfare. The Bible says these words in Ephesians. Take up the shield of faith by which you may be able to extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked one. If you know that verse, say amen. amen. I've searched and I've done studies and I've preached on all the armor of God, the helmet of salvation and everything else. And all of a sudden, while I was preparing this series, God spoke to me and he said, do you want to know what the shield of faith is? I said, yeah, God, please. He said, obedience. Obedience to his commandments automatically raises the shield of faith against the fiery darts of the wicked one. Obedience to his word raises those shields of faith up for us. Because what happens is, and Jesus demonstrated the shield of faith for us when he was out in the wilderness for those 40 days and 40 nights, tempted of the devil. And each time, listen now, each time the devil attacked him and tempted him, he replied with, it is written. So in other words, he took the word of God, which was his shield, and he lifted it up towards the attack, the temptation of the enemy. And when he did that, on the third shot, the enemy left him. Are you hearing that? All it was was obedience to the word of God that raises the shield. It's that simple. When we're obedient of, to the word, we will eat of the good of the land. In fact, let me show you something. Just hold your place here real quickly, but turn over to Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, real quick. I don't want to go through the whole chapter, but I want to give you some highlights that are really, really important. When the enemy attacks us, he is limited, listen to me carefully, he is limited by the authority of heaven. If you remember when he asked about Job and said, the reason Job is living so well is you have a hedge of protection around him. Why did God have a hedge of protection around Job? because Job was obedient to God. A hedge of protection around you is just like having this giant shield of faith surrounding you. Now watch what God says in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. He says these words in the first and second verses. Our shield of faith becomes our word. Listen now. The word of God becomes our shield of faith, and when we obey the word, it works for us. Deuteronomy 28, 1. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord. If you write in your Bible, you ought to underline that. If you're looking at it on your iPhone, your iPad, or whatever, your fire tablet, you ought to highlight that. If you... If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, underline this next statement, to observe and to do, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And, look at this in the second verse, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. You know what that says? When you're obedient, you get the blessings. When you're obedient, you raise the shield of faith. When you're obedient, you can institute and activate the laws of heaven that override the carnal natural laws that we have to live under. When we get sick, 
Because we know Jesus, we can claim the spiritual promise that by his stripes we are healed. Somebody say amen. Now watch this, because this is of such great significance. God says, if you hearken unto my voice, if you're obedient to do what I tell you to do, all these blessings shall come and overtake you. So you're walking along in your life. You're trying to live according to the laws of God. And as you're walking, all these blessings start coming and overtaking us. Now watch this, because this is really something. He says there, if you will do that, these blessings will be yours. Do you know from the first verse all the way to the 14th verse, it covers every blessing that God will bestow on us? Every blessing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you are facing or what blessing you need. It's covered in those first 14 verses. Then he says, but if you will not hearken unto me in the 15th verse, if you will not hearken unto me, then these curses will come and overtake you. And he lists all these curses from the 15th chapter to the 68th, uh, from the 15th verse all the way through till the 68th verse. In other words, 14 verses describe what God will do if you're obedient and if you're disobedient, 54 verses tell you the consequences of disobedience. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be obedient. Hello? I'm going to do what God says. Amen? I'm going to try to follow what God's word says, and I'm going to do it. And I realize now what God meant in 1 Samuel when he said, obedience is better than sacrifice. All I got to do is be obedient to God's word to the best of my ability, and the shield of faith goes up and protects me. All I've got to do is hearken unto his voice, listen to what he says, and do it, and the shield of faith protects me. Now, I want to explain something to you why that works. When the enemy came to earth, was cast down, and got the power transferred from Adam and Eve, who were spirits, to him, he got his spiritual authority back perverted. Let me say that again so you understand that. Adam and Eve over here, they had all the power, they had all the authority, they were spiritual being, they were operating under the spiritual laws of heaven. The earth now is under that covering. The moment they eat of the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they transfer that spiritual authority to him who was before that limited to the laws of earth. He now can operate under the laws of spiritual heaven only he has not the creative power, he has the perverted power. So in other words, he can't come and create cancer in you. What he has to do is pervert the laws of nature to make cancer form in you. Now I know it's by what we eat and every, all kinds of other things that cancer comes on us, but this is a spiritual thing and we are spiritual people. Please say amen to that. This is just what we live in when we're here on this earth. We shed this when we go to God and be with him when we pass from this earth. So watch this, because this is really important to you. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. So the devil can only use what the spiritual laws that he's perverted from heaven against us. But when we're obedient, we are fulfilling, listen to this now, we are fulfilling the laws of righteousness. I'm in right standing with God. God again is my spiritual father. God again has control of my life. I am obedient, I'm listening, I'm walking according to his word. And now what happens is when I begin to write myself with God according to his word, 
I begin to render the enemy's power powerless. He has to operate by the law. You remember Job again? You remember Job again? Satan went to God and said, you, you, you've been protecting him. Take your hands off of him. And God said, okay, I'll take my hands off of him, but you can't kill him. So the limitation that was placed on Satan was a spiritual law of heaven. And he must operate in the laws of heaven. That's why when you cry out, Jesus, 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 he is rendered powerless. All those thoughts trafficking in your mind, you yell out, Jesus, 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 and see what happens to that. Because he's operating in a perverted spirit realm. Please say amen, please. So what happens is when they ate the forbidden fruit, they needed somebody to come back and get this thing back restored God sends Jesus to the earth and when he comes, he restores the spiritual authority back to any man or woman who will accept him as Lord and Savior of their lives. And now I can operate again under the spiritual laws of heaven and not be limited to what happens here. That's why I can worship God and the tooth pops out. That's why we can pray last night. We were praying for John and Marguerite, the pastoral staff and, and the, the prayer chain, right, Linda? We were praying, and you know, everything that they thought was wrong with them, not a thing. They weren't worried about the cracks in their skull. They weren't worried about that. The only thing that's happening right now is they're, they're in surgery for the, for the humor. The, the, the leg bone, right? Out of all of that, and the car has been totaled, a truck hit them, they could have all been dead, but prayer beforehand, during, and after took care of the situation, and that spiritual authority over everything. Somebody say amen, please. So here's what happens. The devil comes in the third chapter of Genesis, and he tricks them. He says to them, has God really said that? And really, if you eat that fruit, do you think you're going to die? How many know that after they ate the forbidden fruit, they were still alive? Hello? They became, you know, generations followed after them. They were the beginning of creation. They didn't die. So what the devil told them was really the truth in the natural realm. Remember now. He has to operate at this point in his, in his existence because he's been cast out of heaven. He has to operate by natural laws. He can't have any authority in the spiritual laws until man transfers them over by being disobedient. So over here, he tricks them and he says, you know what, has God really said that? I'm sure you won't die. So he told the truth, but he didn't tell the whole truth. And that's exactly what the enemy does today. He will tell you a truth, but he won't tell you the whole truth. He'll tell you, go ahead, take a hit on that, on that marijuana joint. Go ahead, take that pill and, get, you know, and just get away from the stress for a while. It won't hurt you. It won't kill you. No, but it'll lead you to hell, won't it? And if you don't believe that, you talk to somebody who has been down that drug avenue or down that drug road. You talk to somebody who has children who are hooked on drugs and they can't get off of them. And they went from vibrant, young, individual kids into, into skeletons. You know, as we ride around with the police officers and we go into these homes and we see these overdoses, you see a person who is, was a vibrant person and they're nothing but a shell of what they used to be. Because why? Because the devil operated in a realm that tricked them today just like he tricked them back then. Somebody say amen. So what happened? They didn't die. Not physically, they died spiritually. They transferred what God had granted to them at the beginning. 
God said, let us make man in our own image and let them have dominion over everything. And when they transferred that authority, they lost the dominion over everything. And we didn't get it back till Jesus came on the cross. And then the transfer of, of that authority was taken back away from the enemy and put back into man. But only for those who choose Jesus. You know what happened? You know what the simple thing is that took place when they did that? When they were here in the spirit realm, before they partook of the fruit, before they became disobedient, they were shielded. They didn't have to work the ground. God supplied everything, and all they had to do was worship him. That's all they had to do was worship him. The moment they transferred that authority to the enemy on that day, they switched from worshiping God to worshiping themselves. See, the enemy said, you'll not die. You'll be like God. You'll know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. So the authority or the purpose of worshiping God who was supplying all their needs now switched back to themselves. And instead of God supplying their needs, now they had to work the fields. They had to work the land. They had to battle the thorns, the thistles. All of those animals that were created for man, some of them turned and began, and we don't have time to go into all that, but some of them turned and became enemies of man. You know, you don't want to get bit by a rattlesnake. Hello? How many know you're not interested in hanging around a bunch of alligators because they're going to attack you, especially when they get hungry? We don't have time to look at that right now, but just get this. Once they switched their authority by, through disobedience, they began to now worship themselves. And God came, and we'll get to that next week. God came down and said, where are you? And, and why are you hiding? Because now they were no longer worshiping him. They were worshiping themselves. And the moment we begin to worship ourselves, listen carefully to me, please. The moment we begin to worship ourselves, our sustenance and our provisions now fall in our own hands. I'm now responsible for my survival. I'm now responsible for my health. I'm now responsible for my life here. But the moment I return to worshiping God from myself, then I can claim Philippians 4.19. Now, because I've restored my worship to you, I can claim my God meets all my needs according to his riches in glory. And the workload of survival is no longer on my life. It's been placed back on him. And his laws and his creative power now works on my behalf. And I become more than a conqueror. Bow your heads with me. Thank you, Lord. 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 Father, how simple it is for us to understand all we've got to do is be obedient to you and the shield of faith goes up. It protects us. Father, obedience is faith. Obedience is faith in action. 
When do we declare and decree what your word says over the situations and circumstances of our lives? You count that as faith in us. And you are moved by faith and not by need. So I thank you today, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we now understand that in worshiping you, we can declare that you meet our needs. In worshiping you, we render the enemy powerless. In worshiping you, we fulfill the, uh, the command to be obedient and hearken unto your word. And we are able to receive all the blessings that come and overtake us. So I thank you today, Father, that we hear what you've said. And that, Lord, we begin to seek your face. We begin to hear your voice. We begin to hearken into what you're saying to us. And we begin to be obedient so that we may eat of the good of the land. And the blessings that you have in store for us will come and overtake us. So I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus for the greatness of who you are in our lives. God, let us grasp what you shared with us today through the anointing of your Holy Spirit that we may activate it in our daily lives, living and worshiping you. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Your heads are still bowed, your eyes are still closed. Maybe somebody's here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. This is your moment. Maybe you're here this morning and you did that a long time ago, but somehow life took its detours on you and you moved into a realm that you never thought you would be in. But because of Jesus Christ today, you can get restored back to the fullness of what he's got for you. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, you don't know the authority and the power that's been given to you. You're struggling here in this world just to make it to the end. But God has something greater for you, a destiny and a purpose. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sins, and to guarantee you a place in heaven, this is your moment, and I want to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you have never did that, you don't know if you're going to heaven. You're not even sure about this whole thing, but you know something's missing in your life and you want to be included in this final prayer of this service today. I just need you to raise your hand in a minute. Don't move, don't jump up here, just raise your hand. If you're here this morning and you got detoured away from what God had for you because of life's pressures and you want to be included in this prayer, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. The only reason I ask you to raise your hand so I know to pray for you for this very moment that you and God may meet in a very special and tangible way. So if you're here right now and you've never asked him to be the Lord of your life or you did it and you've gotten detoured and you know you need to come home, would you lift your hand up right now so I can include you in this prayer? Someone here right now, quickly. You want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life or you want to return to him? Father, if there is anyone here, this is their moment right now. If you've never made that decision, it's your turn right now. So I can include you in, you know, I know there's somebody here or God wouldn't have me make this invitation. Your life could be just like John and Marjorie Parker's children. You could walk out of here and life could be ended for you and you would spend an eternity in hell. Please don't do that. This is your moment in time to change the reservations of where you're going. So if you're here right now and want to be included in this prayer, this is your chance. Raise your hand quickly. Thank you, Nicholas. Father, I thank you that if there is one here right now and they've not made that decision or they've not come back to you as you've been calling them, before they depart from this building today, let them come in contact with another believer who will speak to them and bring them the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. I thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you stand up to your feet? We're going to worship God. Ushers will dismiss you by rose. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. 
I pray you enjoyed our broadcast today, and I wanted to let you know that our church family would love to have you join us here in our sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning, we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Our Sunday services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study and our blast zone for kids 5 to 12. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God, and that happens at 715 every Wednesday night. For more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of our great church, and you'll see what God is doing in the lives of our families. Until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours. what we want to do with this outreach ministry and building this treatment center for the lepers is to give them their medications for free. The government uh, will provide that and, uh, and to reach out to those who have such a desperate need in this area of their life. And that's what God did. He took the first step. While we were still lost in our sin, Jesus still died for us. site where we're believing God to be able to purchase this land and uh, build a uh, clinic here and uh, a little home for the lepers here. We're just outside of Tenali, India. And I have uh, two special gentlemen with me. This is Dr. Samuel. And uh, Dr. Samuel had worked with Mother Teresa in her lepers clinic in Calcutta. He is now up in the Tenali area. And uh, he is one of the members of our local church, our headquarters church here in Tenali. And this is Bishop Isaiah. Yes. And uh, this is the church that Dr. Samuel uh, attends. Yes. 